And last thing, Wemby Holmgren is a dud. But at least we got this photo, which really makes you recognize how much pressure there is on the referee for the jump ball. It's like putting an angel on top of the Christmas tree while standing on one foot on a stool next to the fireplace. Let's go. Some people practice the long way to the referees practice tip ball. They look like giraffes fighting. Some of us have seen that here. New York next. It was a mysterious rotator cuff injury that had Deshaun Watson missing four games earlier this season. This is a new injury sustained in the first half versus the Ravens, a fracture in the right shoulder. He played the rest of the game with it, led the comeback, then he told his team. His season now over, and what now for the Browns? Six and three? It'll be P.J. Walker and Dorian Thompson-Robinson for the playoff push. Kevin Stefanski said today, Thompson Robinson, the rookie, will start Sunday against Pittsburgh. Kevin, so we have that news. Is Thompson Robinson the right call? And then we have the big picture. Can the Browns survive Watson's season-ending injury? Okay, I woke up this morning, Tony Rowley, thinking the Cleveland Browns could make the playoffs and steal a playoff game on the strength of their defense. This afternoon, after this news, I feel the exact same way. This is a defense that has allowed a score on just 22% of offensive possessions. That's the lowest in the league by far. And Deshaun Watson, his yards per attempt this year is lower than Jimmy Garoppolo, Desmond Ritter, and Gardner Minshew. Uh, Dorian Thompson-Robinson is the option here because he has the higher ceiling. We kind of know what, what we're going to get with, 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 with the other guy. Um, but... Josh Dobbs should have been the other guy. This is a team-building <laughs> failure. You should have had a plan behind an unreliable quarterback. This is on Andrew Barry. But you still believe the Browns have a playoff team this afternoon with news of losing Watson for the year. Israel Gutierrez, same question to you. Well, it's interesting that it's coming on the heels of that second half that he had in the last game because, you know, 14 for 14, everybody thinks, oh, Deshaun Watson's back and he is going to carry the Cleveland Browns. When if you look at the entire picture of his situation in Cleveland, it has not been a good one. He has not been especially good, uh, has not been consistent, has not been on the field enough. This team is obviously winning as Kevin threw some of those stats out there, some of the more simple stats there. Uh, first in the league in, in yards allowed, first in the league in passing yards allowed, and their top five in sacks and interceptions and, and points allowed. And so that, all you really need is a competent quarterback to deal with that and the Browns unfortunately have a very high paid quarterback who's just not on the field enough can they recover from this absolutely they can still make the playoffs but they need to address the quarterback situation going forward if they can trust him to stay on the field if not have to find a capable backup which is not going to cost. so you them. still feel Cleveland's a playoff team and you think the bigger story may be looking forward and whether they can trust Watson in the future Woody first start with this season right now this Browns team six and three and now the quarterback position, really a question mark. I'd prefer to start with I'm concerned about Clark. If he wakes up in the morning and the first thing he thinks about are the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> I think about Frank. Uh, that's <laughs> right, Woody. Okay. <laughs> Yes, but in regard to this team, I, I don't think there's any way they're going to make the playoffs. I know it looks impressive now. That if you check the schedule, forgive me, Tony, but if you check the schedule, I think there's four more losses in there. And I just don't believe that they are going to be able to make the playoffs, and given that you've got two quarterbacks on that roster now that you're going to play with the rest of the year. They are one in eight in terms of touchdowns against interceptions. And that's really good. Who are you going to put your – I don't care how good their defense is. They're going to have to score some points. And I don't think it will happen with a rookie or with a guy that basically belongs in one of the other leagues, not the National Football League. I, I think they're in for real trouble. And in regard to the future, you've got a guy that's got a fully guaranteed contract. His salary cap for the next three years is going to be $63.9 million. And you don't know whether he's going to be healthy enough enough to, to play after coming back from all these injuries that he continues to have? No. And Clinton Yates. You know, we can get into sort of the karmic elements of what's going on with the Browns from a history standpoint, but the bottom line was is that the bottom line is that getting Deshaun Watson was a bad football move on top of everything else. He had been out of the game for so long. You did not know what his availability was going to be or even what he was going to turn out to. And I just don't think that this has worked. And then when you make the decision to actively trade Josh Dobbs, homeboy the pastronaut who's out here getting it done for DTR, who listen, I've seen this guy play, he went to UCLA, I know what he's got, but he's not the same player I think that you 
you need in order to supplement this defense. The Browns have made bad decisions around this situation the entire time, and this is just a football version of reaping what you well, saw. With Thomas Robinson, he did have an incredible preseason, at least by their standards, and that's what made the Dobbs move, I guess, happen. But, Kevin, a lot has been said about Watson's future here. It was the rust, then it was the injury, and now what do the Browns have going forward? Yeah, even the 14 for 14 in the second half that Israel mentioned came after a first quarter in which he was one of 10 to start the game, the worst quarter of his career. So it's been all inconsistent. Even the last four games, I mentioned yards per attempt, it's still 7.1, which is mediocre. Um, so even as highs haven't been that high, the lows have been very low. He might play better, but this is never going to become a good trade and never going to become an offensive good team. News of the day, Deshaun Watson season ending surgery. The Browns 6-3 and three against Pittsburgh Sunday. Another team in the playoff hunt. you got to imagine that game will loom large as the season progresses. We've been horned. We'll move on. Timberwolves 104, Warriors 101. Minnesota, seven straight wins. And in that stretch, wins over Boston, Denver, and the Warriors twice. This game's melee, we're going to show it to you right now. Thompson holding McDaniels. McDaniels, vice versa, tearing Thompson's jersey. Everyone comes in quick. Gobert hands around Thompson's upper body, shoulders, green, hands and arms over Gobert's neck in the rear naked chokehold. Thompson, McDaniels, green, ejected. Gobert was ruled to be somewhat of a peacemaker, so not ejected. Steve Kerr did not agree with that, said Gobert's hands were on Thompson's neck. And then Kerr said that's why Green went to the neck of Gobert. Kerr also didn't think Thompson should have been ejected. All this came 100 seconds into the game when the score was 0-0. And this from Gobert. Every time Steph doesn't play, Green doesn't want to play without him. So he goes and does anything to get ejected. Called it clownish behavior. And the stats do show that. Last 10 ejections for Draymond Green, and that's a ridiculous statement that someone had that many to begin with, seven of them came when Steph was not playing. Israel Gutierrez around the horn to you was, the ejections last night right, and should there be more punishment? Well, first of all, it's good to see Draymond fighting players on other teams again. Uh, rather than his okay, own team. All right. And I do think this is also a product of sort of the back-to-back the -back home games, you know, that teams are playing now on the schedule to keep some of the travel limited because they were already upset with each other after the last game, and now you have no step, and Draymond's going to see the first opportunity to get out of the game, as Rudy said. But mm. I do think the league needs to take a serious look at this and give Draymond Green a fairly long suspension because if you just look at not only his history of what he's done in the league, but his history against Rudy Gobert, okay? Rudy Gobert was clearly going there to be a peacemaker, and Draymond Green saw red and decided to put him in a chokehold and if you think about other players in that position if they were I don't know Joel Embiid would Draymond Green be doing that absolutely not so if somebody looks at a situation a skirmish and says hey I don't like that guy I'm going to take an opportunity to in this case put him in a chokehold yeah you've got to do something about that Draymond Green feels too entitled when it comes to this game he, uh, with the refs with opposing players he's got the, uh, the podcast that he can go out and just refute anything that he hears publicly so yeah they need to step in and say hey you still have to play under the rules of this NBA, and that was beyond out of control. And you say fairly long suspension for Green. What is fairly long in your eyes? I'd say in the five to ten game range. In print somehow, of reaching out, calling each other crybaby or you don't belong in this league. And Tony, to follow up on your statistic about the seven out of the ten that Curry didn't play in, the first time he was uh, kicked out of a game, uh, uh, Green was playing against Gobert in that game. So he, Gobert knows his history in regard to that. But I, I think that he does determine that he needs more punishment than the one game he got in the playoffs when he stepped on Sabonis' chest. He's a repeat offender. This is detrimental, as the league says, to the league. And three, it's conduct unbecoming. I think he should be suspended to the end of November. That would be seven games and not play back uh, in the league in until December. Clinton Yates on what you saw last nope. night and should there be more punishment? 
My thing about it is, you know, we can talk about the league, we can talk about his reputation, but in general, for the Warriors, what Draymond Green used to bring to the table was an edge that got other players off of what they were in order to be able to upset their apple cards. Now, it feels like Draymond is the one losing the psychological battle, and reminder, they lost both of these games to the Timberwolves. He challenged Ant on the court, guess what Ant did? Took over the game, and they won that bad boy. It's one thing to talk about who Draymond is as a guy. It's another thing to look at this from a team standpoint and say, hey, this isn't helping, and that's the point we're at right now. With the and just to get a number here, do you believe there should be further punishment after after? What? I'd go 10. I think 10, 10 is games as well. Wow, these, are, these are yeah. substantial suspensions. You can't here. grab guys by the neck in the middle of a game, Tone. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Come on. And Kevin Clark, how do you see it? We're at right now. With the and just to get a number here, do you believe there should be further punishment after after? What? I'd go 10. I think 10, 10 is games as well. Wow, these, are, these are yeah. substantial. Suspension. You can't there. grab guys by the neck in the middle of a game, Tone. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Come on. And Kevin Clark, how do you see it? Help. He's going to do this stuff anyway, Steve, so you don't need to sort of support him publicly. This and time. something that gets lost because it was such a melee. The Minnesota Timberwolves have won seven straight against as good a schedule as anybody has played this year. How real are the T-Wolves, Clinton Yates? They are a fantastic team. Best league pass alert squad we've got. Anthony Edwards is him, as the kids say. Israel Gutierrez. Excellent defensively, which is the biggest key. But yeah, the offense sort of going around Anthony Edwards as opposed to Carl Anthony Towns most of the time just suits this team a lot. What better. do you saw them beat your Nuggets in the last uh, couple, couple games? Yeah, I was impressed with them in the first round of the playoffs last year. I thought they played the Nuggets harder than any of the other teams until they got to the finals. I can see them coming. You see them coming. You can see us going right now. Buy or sell next. What we didn't get in the first couple weeks of college football playoff rankings, we do now. A jump. Georgia with the throttling of former top 10 Ole Miss. Now number one. Leaping Ohio State who falls to two. Michigan, <coughs> America's team, with their win of former top 10 the offensive Penn State doesn't move. They stay at three. Florida State, Washington, Oregon stick at four, five, six. Israel Gutierrez, buy or sell this week's ranking. I'm going to sell where Washington is. I was going to say time they play a ranked team, they put up at least 35 points. But so does FSU. So that's not a great argument for jumping FSU. But I would say they're more consistent offensively for sure, putting up 30, 40 points pretty much every single week. And I think FSU has not really shown that consistency against the lesser team. So I would have put Washington ahead of FSU. Kevin Clark. I'm buying Georgia being the number one team in the country. They should always be number one in these rankings until proven otherwise. Uh, they are the perfect program right now. I think that Washington should probably be number four, just in the sense that they have the best win in the country. Florida State played an inconsistent game against a Miami team they should not be in a one-score game with. I say that with love and respect with the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, but you know what? It'll work itself out. It'll work itself out. Woody Page, how about you? Well, I'll tell you why it's going to work itself out. That's because work itself uh, out. Florida State's going to end up playing in the championship game against Louisville. Uh, Oregon and Washington will play again in the yes, Pac-12 championship. Alabama and Georgia will play mm -hmm. in the SEC We know the schedule, yes. And Michigan and Ohio State will play. So it doesn't matter what it is right now. As the Bingo Beatles sang, it, itself, it will work itself It'll out. It'll work itself out. I hear this every year about college football. <laughs> Somehow I don't believe it. Clinton Yates, how about you? Right. It'll work itself out as if we haven't been arguing over the format of this for decades in itself on its own. Washington clearly is a team that should be in the number four. They've got a Heisman candidate, and they got a bunch of guys on that offense who are going to play on Sunday who are not named Penix Jr. as well. I would love to see sure. them. But the whole it'll work itself out. Let's just, while it's working itself out, Woody, what happens if Alabama beats Georgia in the title game? Then you have the one loss, Alabama. Yeah, the one thing. And then what happens if Texas well, wins won. out? Then they all could be. You see, this happens every year, guys. We've been here before. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. Jets coach Robert Sala today. Aaron's a big boy, grown man. And uh, uh, no one's going to know Aaron's body like Aaron knows his body. And if he feels, after all the doctors clear him, and I'm sure there's a million of them, I have no idea on that stuff. But if, if Aaron says he wants to play, he's going to play. Kevin, if Aaron says he wants to play, he's going to play. How do you hear that from the coach, Robert Sala? 
I'm selling this entire concept. I understand why Robert Sal would want to indulge Aaron Rodgers and why Aaron Rodgers would set these goals to get healthy sooner. But right now, the Jets are allowing a 60% pressure percentage on third down with Zach Wilson back there. That's not all Zach Wilson's fault. Why would you put an aging quarterback who's trying to set a record for an Achilles return behind that line getting hit that much? This is a two-year decision. See you in September, Aaron. Israel Gutierrez? Well, first of all, is he a big boy or a grown man? You got to pick one. Second of all, he did say when the doctors clear him, right? So he's basically saying it's not my decision, it's not Aaron's decision, it's going to be a doctor's decision. And so while the rest of us can sit here and laugh and say, Aaron, you're crazy, you're not coming back from a Achilles tear that quickly, if Aaron keeps saying it, what is his head coach supposed to say? So he basically gave the only answer he could there. Yes, if he's medically clear, he is a grown man who, if he chooses to, wants to play, we're going to let him play. There's a lot of ifs there, but if Aaron keeps saying this, he's going to have to show up someday, is he not? Woody Page, how'd you hear Sala there? I'm selling the coach. Uh, we've paid attention to him while he's talked about Zach Wilson the last three weeks. Now he's talking about Aaron Rodgers, who's not on the roster. He's not in town except when he comes for a game and throws on the sidelines to attract attention. So he's not going to make that decision. It's going to be made for him, for both of them. So I don't know why he's talking about it now. You just kind of dismiss it and say, we'll reach that road when we get there. Not now. Clinton Yates? He's talking about it because this is part of the package when you get Aaron Rodgers. He is the story. Here's the cart. Here's the horse regarding him actually getting on the football field. I think this conversation is one that is not really of import until we actually see him put on a helmet and pads and play on the field. Until then, we're just talking about a guy who's not on the team. Are you suggesting it will work itself out then with uh, with the doctors <laughs> then making a decision? Perhaps. Science. Tough one for him. Woody Page. Kevin Clark. One hair part's going one way, one hair part's going the other way, and I'm like, hey, what do you want from me? Woody, I like those glasses you were rocking before. It kind of looks like a, uh, a Nick Nolte look from uh, 1990s or something. There it is. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, Kate Fear, Nick Nolte. Showdown next, Clint Yates, Israel Gutierrez. It'll work itself out. Clint Yates, Israel Gutierrez, good luck in showdown. LSU was trailing Kent State in the second half. But then turned it on. Michaela Williams. Could you expand a little bit more on why Poole didn't play and why Reese didn't play in the second half? Yeah, I could, but I won't. Just a coach's decision. Clinton, how do you hear Mulkey there? You think everything's all right with Coach Star and these defending champs after the last two weeks? Uh, not great, Bob. That's not the reaction you want from somebody who's known to talk a lot about their players in many different ways. And she was discussing earlier in the week how Anissa Morrow is still trying to figure out how to get with that team. They got a lot of transfers. And even though they got a lot of talent, that's still basically what the job is in college basketball these days, getting people to get together and get on the same page. They're having some trouble with it down there in the body. Mm. Israel Gutierrez? I mean, this sounds like a woman who is coaching hard. And where is Frank Isola right now to ask if Angel Reese, maybe with a year of fame and all these riches, has had a little bit too much? But look, it's like Chicken Little said, you know it when you see it, and that's some coaching. <laughs> I can see it. The Chicken Little, uh, yeah, that was from last week where it maybe didn't land. This one absolutely lands because they won by chicken 30. How great. <laughs> I mean, that was getting it done. Point Israel Gutierrez. Showdown two, Kansas over Kentucky. Duke over Michigan State in the Champions Classic. Israel, give me the number one takeaway from last night there. My number one takeaway is that Kentucky is only showing you a little bit of what they can do. Their bigs were not available to them yesterday, basically, and they still hung in there with that big Kansas team. And the bench, they've got uh, Rob Dillingham coming off the bench. This guy is a firecracker. He's going to have 30-point games off the bench if they keep him, keep him off the bench, on the bench, rather, because he's so talented. I think when Kentucky gets healthy, they're going to be scary. Lynn Yates? The story for me is Hunter Dickinson. I mean, who knew? A name we know that's been around men's college <laughs> basketball for a while. He goes from blue blood to blue blood, and he took the highest bidder. That's how you work the system, kiddos. I love this kid, man. Mm. Kentucky's getting the point. Israel Gutierrez is getting the win. 30 seconds of FaceTime. Thank you, Tony. And we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about Chet Holmgren and Victor Wembanyama and saying who's the favorite for Rookie of the Year. Well, who went out and had a great light night last night? Uh, not those two guys. It was Asar Thompson for the Detroit Pistons. 21 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists, a ridiculous baptism of Clint Capella on the break. I mean, just the most impressive dunk you'll see this year. It's a shame 
that his brother, his twin brother of men, is hurt, has an ankle injury in Houston. And it's kind of a shame that the Detroit Pistons have lost nine games in a row more than any other team this year. But I'm still watching them like I'm Eminem because Asar Thompson is worth watching. He's so much fun. I actually would put him right now atop the rookie.